are going to talk about Anselm. This time we're going to talk about his work, Cur Deus Homo, Why the God-Man. Now, this is an entire work devoted to explaining what God in Christ was doing, or God in Christ atoning for us. And the idea of atonement is really the center of what we're going to be focusing on in this and the next video. Um, it'll help you to know that Anselm sets this up not as a monologue or a direct speech to God, as in his other work, but as a dialogue. And his dialogue partner is a guy named Bozo. Okay, I, I think you're supposed to say Basso, but I like to pronounce it Bozo, because that's just more fun. But ba Basso, or Bozo, was a, an abbot during Anselm's time, highly respected, and so he's a, a, a capable dialogue and debate partner with Anselm. But we're going to use him as that sort of figure that comes in and asks the other side of the question to kind of help move the thing along. In fact, I'm kind of excited. I've got Bozo with me today. Come on, Bozo. Don't be shy. Step in front of the camera. <laughs> okay, that's not Basso. That's, that's the actual Bozo the Clown. Um, that was the most beloved clown of all children from my youth. And it strikes me that many of you who are watching this have probably never even heard of Bozo the Clown. Bozo? No. B-O-Z-O. -O. Sorry. I... You've never heard of Bozo the Clown? No. I can't verify this, but I've been told that Bozo the Clown actually got his name from Basso, Anselm's dialogue partner. And the way this works is that although Anselm was a worthy dialogue partner, over the years, uh, anytime someone would come up and kind of ask stupid questions, the abbot would have to say, oh, here comes that bozo, ask that clown, asking these silly questions. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but we're going to use bozo to help us talk about Anselm's theory of satisfaction. And we'll come back and ask whether or not this is really convincing and persuasive and see what maybe the strengths and weaknesses of his views are. Okay, I should start by giving a very brief recap of Anselm's logic and the basics of his theory of the atonement. And to do so, I'm going to use his word uh, for humanity, man, right? I'm not using the gender inclusive as we would normally prefer, but I'm going to say instead of humankind or humanity, I'm going to use his term man, because that will help be able to summarize this quicker. He wants to point out that the relationship between God and man is broken. And it's broken because of man's rebellion against God. And now the question is, how can this relationship be restored? And he does so by saying that first, it's not as if man could just work back toward God. And the reason is because man owes a debt that is so great, man cannot pay it. Because, after all, what he owes God is a life of honor and glory to God, not a life of disobedience and rebellion from God. Bozo might ask, why doesn't man just spend the rest of his life paying back honor to God? Well, good question, Bozo. But man already owed an entire life of honor to God. And on top of that, now he has broken fellowship, rebelled against God, and dishonored God. So he can't pay that back by doing what he should have been doing anyway. So man has a debt he cannot pay. It's of infinite worth. Why doesn't God just pay it for him? Why doesn't God just somehow forget it and take the debt onto his Part of the ledger? Well, that's a fair question, Bozo, but the problem there is that God doesn't owe this debt. And for God to pay a debt that God doesn't owe would be unrighteous, unfitting, unjust, and all those things. So for Anselm, it's impossible, it would be improper and ungodly for God to pay a debt that only man owes. But man can't pay this debt because it's of infinite worth. So 
if this is a debt that only man should pay, but it's a debt that only God can pay, the solution is very simple. Jesus becomes the God-man. He, as God, is of infinite worth and can pay this debt. And then, as having become man, it's proper that he pays this debt. In a nutshell, that's the basics of Anselm's theory of satisfaction. Okay, so far, Bozo is impressed. After all, it is a very um, well-balanced, symmetrical argument. But Bozo, are you convinced? I didn't think so. Well, here's one of the reasons why we might not be convinced today. Anselm is dealing with a worldview that takes the classical, what are called the transcendentals, of goodness, truth, and beauty. And for him, if something is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful argument, then it must be a true argument and a good argument. Let me show you what I mean by going to another place where he tries to lay out a, a beautiful, a symmetrical argument. A, a term that he uses more than any other is something is most fitting as opposed to something that would be unfitting. He lays out an argument where he's trying to explain why the God-man, Jesus, came born of a virgin. So there's probably several reasons we could give. The biblical reasons would be things like this is proof of who uh, Christ's true father is. But Anselm has something even more. He has a philosophical, beautiful reason. He first lays out the fact that there are four options for how Christ could be born. And follow through, follow these, because I think that um, we're going to want to ask, are, are these the only options? Right, Bozo? <laughs> Thought so. So the first option is that God could have ma made Christ's human nature, his human flesh, from neither man nor woman. <laughs> Second option, he could have made Christ's flesh simply from a man. Third option, he could have made Christ's flesh from both a man and a woman. And then fourth option, he could have made Christ's flesh from a woman. Now let's look over this list first. Are we forgetting anything? Bozo would like to know, aren't there other options? You might say, maybe God could have created a human being uh, ex nihilo, from nothing. Oh, well, that actually is covered under option one. Or maybe some other uh, thing altogether. Maybe God made humanity from uh, dirt. Oh, well, that's also covered under option one. Is there some combination of options? Oh, yes. Well, that's covered under option three. So I think we do have to give Anselm credit. These are four exhaustive categories. It must be one of the four. And now we can go through the list and ask, has God selected each of the four? Has God ever taken option one, where he made a human being from neither a man nor a woman? The answer is obviously he did in Adam. Okay, what about option two? Has he ever made a human being only from a man? Oh, yes, he did that with Eve. And then what about option three? Has God ever made a human being from both a man and a woman? Yes, he did that with all the rest of us. And up until the time of Christ's incarnation, option four is the only option available. And Anselm would say it is most fitting, most appropriate, that God would check off all of the logical boxes. I mean, you got to hand it to Anselm. That's a, that's a beautiful argument. It's a symmetrical argument. It's a most fitting explanation of the options. And for Anselm, if something is beautiful, then it must be true, and it must be good. Well, if you're still not convinced, it's very likely because you don't share the same optimistic epistemology that Anselm shared. And we don't have time to go into this, but Anselm's optimistic epistemology is really going to steer him at times into some problems. And then the whole scholastic tradition is always going to be at risk of overstating their case 
and being too certain of where reason will lead them, which gets us into the whole problem of modernity. Now, today, we might be dealing in the aftermath of this, in what's called post-modernity. We're not so sure there is such a thing as something like beauty. I mean, it's often said beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So just because something is beautiful to you doesn't make it true or good. So these transcendentals that Anselm is dealing with may not apply directly today. If you're interested in this, I would give hope to this kind of argument, though, because Anselm derives this from earlier writers like Augustine. And Augustine actually shares our very pessimistic epistemology. Augustine is constantly willing to admit that uh, the skeptics have something to say. The skeptic could point out that anything we see as true, our senses might be fooling us. And just because we uh, n know that there is some cause and effect, we're not always sure what the cause is. Maybe there's more than one cause. But Augustine has ways of overcoming this, and it usually involves things like dialectics and others, but it really boils down to faith. Yes, this is something that you have to accept by faith, but that faith doesn't have to be unreasonable. Even if reason alone won't persuade you to this view, the faith itself might be a very reasonable kind of faith. And so it's per perfectly appropriate for people like Augustine and now Anselm to allow their faith to seek understanding. Now, if you're not persuaded, you probably need to see what the alternatives are to Anselm's satisfaction theory of the atonement. So tune back into the second video and we'll try to address those. All right, just forget it. Forget it? Me for you should forget it. You're living in the past, man. You hung up on some clown from the 60s, man. Uh